To become a subscriber and stay current with us and everything that we do, please click on the subscribe button below and have a good day. As we look and as we consider the book of Hebrews, as I, as I look into it, it's like, well, why Hebrews? Why do we go into the book of Hebrews? And, uh, and I want to say that I, I believe it's crucial because it is, um, you know, it, it's a book. Well, first of all, I want to say most of us aren't Hebrew, right? Most of us don't have Jewish roots. And it's not exclusively written to the Jewish people, but I think there's some important things to take a look into because our faith is rooted in Hebraic roots. It's rooted in Judaism. But I also want to make note that the Israeli Jews were given, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9, they were given the adoption as sons. They were given the glory. They were given the covenants. They were given, you know, the giving of the law and the temple services and the promises. And... You know, even from a Jewish perspective, because I, it was written, the, the word Hebrew actually means pilgrim. And so, you know, it's, it, it very much applies to us. But when you look at the actual text itself from the, the day and time, uh, we know that the patriarchs were Jewish. We know that Jesus was and is Jewish. You know, did you know that there's going to be a Jewish man that will serve from a Jewish city for all of eternity? Right? He's, he's going he's gonna to set up his throne and, and it'll be established there. But Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 9, he says, when it comes to Israel, he says, they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel, neither are the children named through Abraham, but through Isaac, meaning that it's not the children of the flesh, but the children of the promise. And so you and I get access to the promises of the roots of our faith, the things that were given to Israel, we now, because we're grafted into the vine, begin to lay hold of, and we have access to all these promises. And I believe that destiny begins to flow out of identity. And my question to you is, do you know your identity? Do you know who you are? Do you know who he is? Do you know by which, you're, you're, um, by which you've been saved, the righteousness that you carry? And, uh, and so we know too that, uh, that because Israel transgressed, the Gentiles began to receive salvation. Salvation was given to the Gentiles because of the, the sin and the transgression of the Jewish people. And so when we begin to walk in those things that God gave to Israel, meaning when we begin to walk in the fullness of the glory, which we saw this, this evening, right? We begin to experience that glory of God, that beauty of God. When we walk as, in the adoption as sons, that we've been adopted into his family, I mean, it's one thing to know it out here, but it's another thing to really be able to experience it. When we walk in the covenants and the promises, as mentioned above, we're gonna, bring, we're gonna provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. And when that happens, according to the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, we're gonna see a reconciliation of the world and life from the dead like we can't even imagine. It's gonna be so rich. It's the, the stuff that we're dreaming of and believing for. You know, I think uh, Maruna mentioned tonight that you haven't seen, I hasn't seen, it hasn't, you haven't heard, you hasn't heard the things that have entered into your heart. You know, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And so uh, tonight we want to take, taking us back to Hebrews, I want to give a bit of an overview of Hebrews and then I'm going to go through Hebrews chapter one, just an overview. I want to encourage you to study the book of Hebrews. Um, even throughout the time, because there's so much there. But first of all, I want to look at the audience of Hebrew, of Hebrews. First of all, Hebrew means pilgrim, and uh, Hebrews is written essentially to pilgrims. Uh, this could mean literal pilgrims, uh, but I believe it's primarily the Messianic believers, but it also applies to us as believers in general, and it could have applied to them then at that point as well. The Hebrews, uh, Hebrews was written to a people that were not new in the faith. And so for us today, as we look at the book of Hebrews, most of us here today would not be new to the faith. You know, we've walked with the Lord for a season, but in walking with the Lord for a season, there, becomes, there comes a danger because sometimes we get used to the, the glory. Sometimes we get used to the benefits of sonship. It, we become accustomed to it, and from that place, uh, we, we lose the, the appreciation I remember John Arnott stated in, in times past that when it comes to Mary and Martha, he would state that what's, you know, what's the difference really between Mary and Martha? Because as we look at John chapter 11, when Jesus came to bring healing and resurrection to their brother Lazarus, Mary, Martha comes out first and she makes a declaration to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. 
And Jesus enters into a discourse with her. Mary comes later, says the same thing, and Jesus begins to weep. And so there's something about that place of relationship and there's something about connection in our hearts coming alive where we're not accustomed to his presence, I believe, that that we want to keep. We want to keep that edge. We want to keep that revelation of who he is. And the comment John made that really kind of gripped me and made me think is, he says, I think the difference between Mary and Martha is, is that Martha got used to having Jesus around. Got, got accustomed to his presence, knew that Jesus would come because he would often spend time there in Bethany, just south of Jerusalem, and spend time at their house. And so she got used to having Jesus around. But there's this thing where, are we used to the glory? Do we get used to the presence of God or do we hang on to this place of appreciation and gratitude for who he is and what he does for you and I as we, you know, as we, as we worship him and as he comes so faithfully once again? And so, you know, Hebrews was written, I believe, to, to those that were new in the faith, but I believe it was written, um, sorry, those that weren't new, but I believe it's, it's, it's again for all of us. Now, there were, in those first 30 or 40 years, uh, there was a lot of different Jewish believers. There was maybe not a few, let me put it that way. No, there was the majority of the known world in that area still needed the revelation, but the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ had gone out uh, to many, many nations, to the entire surrounding area. And so we know that these um, Jewish believers, many of the ones to whom were reading this, many of them would have turned their back on the world and its ways and... Uh, Sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit because I can't quite read my notes. So I, it's like, God, I need healing on my eyes as well. So I'm doing without glasses. I don't want them. Who needs healing in your eyes tonight? Okay, put your hand on your eyes. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we believe tonight. Let healing come. We speak life to our eyes in Jesus' name. Lord, release your glory. We believe for great testimonies to start to happen. Now I want you to test it. Test it on something. Go look at something again and see if... Come, Lord, keep pouring out your spirit. Okay. So these Jewish believers had turned their back on the world um, and its ways, the ones that received it. And, sorry, they, they turned their back on the world. You know, the ones that had received Christ had turned their back on the world around them as they ought to have done because they received the message of the gospel of Jesus. They also rightly turned their, their backs on the ordinances of the law. Because, again, you've got these 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 people to whom the gospel was given, the Jewish people who received the message of Jesus and they recognized that they no longer needed to follow the ordinances of the sacrifice. So they turned their back on the world and on the ways of the world. They turned their back on the law and all the ordinances of the sacrificial system. And here they are, time goes by, and they're waiting for the Lord to return because Jesus promised to return, and he didn't return. And it's easy to begin to grow a little bit disillusioned in the midst of this. When are you coming back? Ever feel that way? Like, when are you coming back, oh God? We're waiting for you. I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little anxious, or I'm getting a little dull in my spirit. And so they turn their back on, on, on all these things. But what happened is, is this left them in the place where they were in no man's land. You know, like they, they, they lost their friendship with the world. They lost their friendship with the Jewish nationality of the people that they'd grown up with. And when you begin to stand out as being different, suddenly you get a lot of attention attracted to you and it's not always pleasant. How many have noticed that? You know, we're different, aren't we? Scripture says you're a peculiar people. You're a royal priesthood. We're different. But when you're different and you stand cross currents, or countercurrent to the tide, you know, they don't always like you. And you begin to, they begin to speak against you in the midst of this. And then you can get attacked because there's a tension put on you. And when you get attacked, it hurts. And, and the pain of that begins to lead us to reconsider, well, was it really worth it? Am I right after all? You know, perhaps I'm being misled or misunderstood. And I can imagine the questions that they were asking, you know, are we wrong about Jesus? The message that we, we heard, are we wrong about who he is? You know, is, what if he's not the Messiah? What if he's not the King of Israel? What if he's not the Savior of the world? I don't know if many, any of you are here tonight and you ask that question, or even online that are listening. What if the new covenant really didn't replace the old? You know, what if, what if, 
we really do need to go back to this this annual and this ongoing sacrifices to be able to atone for our sins so that we don't have to carry this guilt consciousness anymore. And so the truth is, is that the audience of this book to whom the writer of the Hebrews would have written, I believe that they were in danger of forsaking the faith. They're in danger of it and giving, you know, giving back into the, the, the shadows or getting back into the shadows of religion once again. And I believe that that's the same place that many in the church are at today, that we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. We've experienced his goodness and his grace, but we stand out. We're different than the tide of the world around us. You know, we don't, we don't carry the same value system as the world. And, you know, then you got even denominationalism where, you know, in the Christian faith, you know, we're, we really value the moving of the spirit, but some people don't and they think you're a little crazy. Jay, do they ever think you're crazy? They think you're crazy a little bit, right? And so it can get a little bit lonely when you feel like you're the only one or you're amongst the few that's there and, and, and disillusionment can easily creep in. And so I believe that what we had in, the, in this, you know, to, the, to, the, to those that were receiving this message at the time is I believe we were having people that needed a plumb line of truth. They needed a course correction. They needed a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel, to once again show the way that they were to go. Because Jesus made clear that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And so, you know, the, the truth is, is that there's a sense of danger. Like, are they, are, are they losing their faith? Are they losing their way? And so by, by opening... By opening their hearts to the, to the deceitfulness of sin, of unbelief, you know, they were in danger also of not being able to overcome the things that were coming their way. By being open to a little bit of, of mixture. You know, we're, we're, we're to be a people without mixture, full of the measure of Christ, the fullness of Christ. But sometimes we mix ourselves. There's a mixture of the world that comes in, but when that happens, are we setting ourselves up to not necessarily overcome what comes our way next? Do you know why you're called overcomers? Because you have to have things to overcome. You're an overcomer, Rafiq. I'm an overcomer. We're all overcomers. Scripture calls us more than conquerors, but it wouldn't do that if there weren't things that you needed to conquer along the way. And so... You know, the, 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 the truth in the midst of this is that pressure creates a bit of a fence. You know, you know it's like a, a, a sword even, as it were. When, when you feel pressure, you've got to stand and make a decision. Am I going to yield to the pressure? Am I going to yield to that spirit of intimidation? Am I going to yield to, to the, the current of the world and enter back into the worldly ways and enter back into that old sinful lifestyle? Or am I going to allow that pressure... To, to begin to build like coal to diamond, you know, begin to release a place of fire and passion and burning within me that will cause me and cause us to stand strong in the face of opposition so that our destiny becomes more fulfilled, so that not only will we stand out, we will stand out and shine. We will shine brightly in the midst of this. And so, you know, the, these Hebrews, these people that were... were the, the message was being addressed to, I believe they were in danger of apostasy. Because as we get through to later passages of Scripture, there, we begin to see that, that the writer to the Hebrews begins to address the fact of some that were in danger of losing their faith and not able to come back. And I'll get into that more whenever it is down the road. Okay, because those are, those are fascinating passages that people will ask about. Well, can I lose my faith? What is that all about? And where we're at with that. And, and so... You know, they were, I believe they were somewhat subject to nearly forfeiting their, their eternal inheritance. I want you to know that regardless of, of where you are in life and the things that you're going through, there's an inheritance that awaits us. You know, we have a father that we sang about tonight that loves you with an amazing, incredible love. And he has made you heirs with Christ Jesus. Jesus is the heir of the world. We're going to get into that with Hebrews chapter 1, but we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. You can't be an heir, which is a H-E-I-R, okay? You can't be an heir if there's nothing to inherit. Heirs inherit. And so there's an inheritance that awaits you and I. 
And it is an inheritance that is extremely worth every bit of pressing and pressure and pain and misunderstanding and accusation that could possibly come your way. It is an inheritance that awaits us, but but the church to whom this letter was written primarily were subject to possibly forfeiting this inheritance. And so the issue of the great falling away and the endurance of the faith, I would say, is one of the primary burdens or the main burdens of this book of Hebrews. And so why am I, why am I going to preach it? Why am I going to talk about the book of Hebrews in the next season of time? Because I believe it's really important for you and I to have this understanding that as we, as we see and read the scriptures, we don't just let it pass over us like water off a duck's back, but it actually penetrates our hearts and our spirits. We allow the truth of the word of God to, ch- to change us, to transform us, because we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And as it begins to transform us, then when the same level of pressure comes your way, it's like it's the water off, the, off your duck's back. Because your eyes are so fixed upon Jesus and who he is. And so that's, that's some of the, you know, the, the, the problem and the background that was there. Now I want to talk about the author and I want to talk about the message. And then we're going to dig into Hebrews chapter 1. God moved on this unknown author, quote unquote, to take up the pen and parchment and write the book of Hebrews. And so who is the author? Now there's a lot of people, probably a majority would say it's probably the Apostle Paul. But the potential problem with that is, is that Paul always names who he is when he writes his epistles, and this one doesn't have a name. So the question is, why didn't he name himself? And yet the writing was such that it could look like Paul. But I want to give you three other options. And in one level, does it really matter? Is it going to change your life? Well, I think it gives you an understanding of the big picture. Because in order to really understand Hebrews and how it applies to you today, it's important to have an understanding of why Hebrews was written, who wrote it, who did he write it to, what was the occasion that required the writing, and then when we understand that, which is called the exegesis, we can begin to apply it to ourselves and our lives today, which is called the hermeneutics, okay, some fancy terminology. But we've got the ability then to be able to take it and say, well, the Word of God is transcendent. It it is powerful, and it transcends the ages and the generations because it's been inspired by God. And and it's meant to bring life, and it's meant to bring courage. And so other possibilities of who wrote it, you know, that the theologians would say is it could have been Barnabas that wrote the the book of Hebrews. It could have been Apollos. You know, these people were, were scholars. They had a background in what was taking place. And they're saying it could have been Priscilla. Now, in the culture at the time, usually they always would name the man first. You know, usually the one that was most spiritual, most engaged, always got named first. And so scripturally in the book of Acts, for example, it used to be Barnabas and Saul or Barnabas and Paul. But then it shifted, and it was Paul and Barnabas because Paul took a bit of a front seat or took a a place of passion or a depth or really entered into all that God had. And he became the primary person of the duo. Now, usually, in a couple, it's always the man and then the woman, you know? So they would say Aquila and Priscilla because Priscilla's husband was Aquila. Now, the funny thing is, this is a bit of an aside, uh, I have a daughter that we named Aquila. Okay, it's like, well, why would you name your daughter a man's name? And, uh, and, and the reason we did it is, number one, we always prayed about it, always prayed about what we're going to name our children. But we felt like it sounded, had that feminine edge, and then we figured most of the church wouldn't know anyway that Aquila was a female, or was a male. (laughs) And and if you're not in the church, you're not going to know either, and so, but it sounded so feminine, and so I don't know how many of you ever thought of that, and probably most of you knew, because you're here on a Friday night, but but it's interesting, because scripturally, they say Priscilla and Aquila, and oh yeah, the rest of the story is, so my daughter, who just moved to Sherbrooke, Quebec, um, you know, she married a guy named Yannick, who's the oldest son of, uh, the oldest of five kids, and he's got two other brothers, and so she was enjoying that, and all of a sudden, you know, a couple years ago, she found out that his next brother was dating a gal named Priscilla, and she's like, no, no, right? (laughs) She began to groan within herself, and she said, well, no problem, you know, Priscilla's from Brazil, I'm living in Geneva, Switzerland, you know, it's not a big deal, it's just a bit of an internal joke and nobody's going to know. But what happened is, is just recently, she moved to Sherbrooke, like I said, but Dan, the brother, did end up marrying Priscilla, 
and they moved to Sherbrooke beforehand. And so now Priscilla and Aquila both live in the same area. <laughs> and she says they're very good friends and they just laugh about it now. So, but um, <laughs> anyway, that's an aside. Um, but the reality is, is that it was Priscilla first. Now, many would think that it's possible that Priscilla wrote it because, first of all, of her primary spiritual leadership and influence in that region, but also because if a woman wrote the book, you know, it would not be considered proper for the, you know, the culture, the Jewish culture, to actually make a note of a woman at that time in that day and age. And so a little bit of conjecture here, but just something for you to, to be aware of. Now, Hebrews... You know, some would think that Hebrews was written before 70 AD when the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, actually. But um, some would also say it's probably written in the second generation. The reason some would feel it was written prior to 70 AD was because of all the references to the sacrificial system, to the sacrificing of blood and goats. Uh, others would say second generation. If it was the second generation, I think it's really helpful for us because how many here are not first generation believers? Meaning, how many of you had your parents that were believers? Hands up. Okay, how many of you, so that, those, that makes you second generation. And sometimes as a second generation believer, you think, well, it's my father's faith. It's my mother's faith. Is it going to be my faith? And we can grow a little bit cold because we need that encounter and experience. But God doesn't have grandchildren. And so it's crucial to develop our own place of faith. And, and so for them, I think it gives a level of understanding as to wherever it was. Now the message, uh, the message to the Hebrews as an overview before we get to Hebrews chapter one is that the writer of the Hebrews prepares them with a vision for eternity. You know, if you and I have an understanding of where we're going, it'll help us keep the path, amen? I mean, I know guys don't like to look at maps very often, right? But if you, if you know where you're going, you don't necessarily need to look at the map if it's a well-traveled road. But, you know, I've not walked this way before. I need my road map. My road map is my Bible, which tonight is my iPad. Right? Look at your map so that you know where you're going. Because we need, we need the place of that map. But that, that map also gives us a vision for eternity. You've been created with a spirit. As a matter of fact, you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. And so your spirit man has been designed and created to be eternal, to live forever. Do you know where you're going? And I don't just mean heaven versus hell. I mean the reality of where you're going, the reality of your destiny. I believe for, for you know, all of us, we have a destiny. But much of our destiny will, will actually be after you shed your earthly body, after your earth suit. That might be a surprise to you. You, you will probably have prophetic words that you do not fulfill in this day and age. I believe they'll be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom or in the ages to come that the book of Ephesians speaks about. Now that said, don't wait till then to lay hold of them. Start praying into them now. Say, God, I want my destiny fulfilled now. I want to begin to cry out because the, the people need to be saved now. Right? You've got a destiny pertaining to the lost now that we want to lay hold of. And so what's your eternal destiny? Do you have a vision for it? The next part to that is, is the vision for dwelling with God forever. You know, do you have an understanding and a degree of vision that you are going to be united with Christ Jesus? As an invitation as the bride of Christ, living with the Father, dwelling with Him forever, and that you have an inheritance in the ages to come. Has that penetrated or permeated your spirit, soul, and body so that it motivates you to begin to step forward and, and develop maturity in your faith? That it motivates you when you wake up in the morning to, to, to enter into the place of prayer and reading the Word of God and loving the people around you, loving the church and loving the lost. Sometimes the church is harder to love than the lost. You know why? Because the lost don't know they're lost yet. But the church knows they're broken. And so they come to Christ. They enter in through the door because they know they're needy in many cases. And so the church is also a bit of a hospital. And so if you can love the church, I believe you can love the lost. And if you can love yourself, you can love others. And the way you learn to love yourself is by having a revelation of the Father's love for you. And so, you know, the writer... Hebrews uses also eschatology or revelation of the end times and the leadership 
of Jesus, the, God's leadership in all of eternity, to call his saints to enduring faith. You know, the truth is, we, there's times we need to endure. You know, those that endure to the end will be saved. And it's, it, it's a rose garden, but it's not always a rose garden because the roses have thorns on the edge of them. And sometimes the prickliness comes from the other saints that are around us. Right? And sometimes it comes from the world that just hates you because they've come to, to hate Jesus. And if you're going to stand with Jesus, they're going to hate you too. And are you prepared for that? You know, good question. Do you think it's a good question? It's a good question. Okay, good. We're in agreement. So it's, and so we, we want to be prepared for where we're at. And we want to remember that we're on a journey to this to this heavenly country, to this city called New Jerusalem. You know, do, do you know where you're going? I remember doing a funeral back in Stratford for a lady, and before she died, she, she, knew, she knew her time was coming to an end, and she says, you know, I don't understand people who, who know they're going to heaven, but they take no time to study it. They take no time to study the New Jerusalem, and she'd study those passages about all the different colors of stones in the book of Revelation and the dimensions of the New Jerusalem coming down, you know, and, and it inspired me. I thought, yeah, that's a good point, you know? I mean, many of us build earthly homes, and we do all these measurements, and we develop our home, and, you know, we want to know exactly what our house is looking like, but we don't even think about our eternal home where we're going to be forever. And this eternal home, by the way, is, I, I did a search on it, it's like 1,500 miles, it's a, it's a diamond shape. And it's about the distance from here in Toronto to close to Denver or here to, is it Fort Lauderdale or Miami, somewhere like that. And it's this, this great diamond-shaped cube, and it's the New Jerusalem. And there's so much more to it, you know, but it's, it's multidimensional. And it's going to rest on, on the city of Jerusalem. One day, heaven is going to come down to earth, and it's going to rest there. I mean, it's, it's, it's stunning. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, but, you know, that's the best description I can give you. Sorry. That's all I know. I haven't been there yet. I haven't got a chance to really visit, but I believe what the Word says. And so, you know, we get this, we get this detail of our, of our destiny, of this new Jerusalem. And the next thing that the message is about, it's about the supremacy of Christ. It's about the, 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 the profound insight into the splendor of Jesus' humanity and into the splendor of his divinity. The glory of who he is as the God-man. You know, God in the flesh, here among us, Emmanuel, God with us, living here. We have this revelation of who he is, but it's also knowing Jesus as a man. You know, the astounding thing is, is that he humbled himself. He gave up his, he gave up this place of glory and he humbled himself and came to the earth. And even there he was born in a manger, the most humble of all circumstances. And so I would say that it's very much about the, the detail, the book of Hebrews gives us detail about the beauty of Jesus. You know, when, when something is beautiful to you, you want to gaze upon the beauty, don't you? Can I suggest to you that you and I really don't know what beauty is? We think beauty is, you know, worldly speaking, is skin deep. It's like, you have such nice skin. You have such nice skin, Myrna. Right? We, we see this beauty, and, and it's great, but you and I have no idea what beauty is. Because beauty, I mean, we do because we've tasted and seen that he's good. But beauty is the faithfulness of God. It's, it's his love. It's his tender mercies and loving kindness that he knew every morning. His beauty is the fact that we can come boldly into his presence. You know, to, to drink deeply, to imbibe deeply. His beauty is, is that he's faithful, that he hears and he answers prayer. His beauty is inexpressible. It's not just what he looks like, which, which would be like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden where there was such glory that surrounded them that they didn't even know they were naked. You know, that, that they were unashamed because the, the glory of God, the beauty, glory is like, it's like beauty. You know, there's a reality of beauty that we've been made for, and I feel like we're just beginning to touch beauty. What is the beauty of this man, Jesus? And some of you may say, well, what about Isaiah 52, the very last verse where it says he was marred beyond any man. There's nothing about him that we should behold him. It's like, well, that was his physical frame and his physical features. But Jesus is a beautiful man because of who he is, the way he provides leadership, his righteousness, his goodness, his meekness, his mercy, that he's tender, his loving kindness. 
You know, he's slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will find you where you are. That's his beauty. His beauty is, is that, like David declares in Psalm 139, which, by the way, oh, look at that. I didn't even read that. It's Psalm 86. I thought he was doing Psalm 139, which talks about, you know, David says in Psalm 139, when, when you go, if I, if I descend into Sheol, you are there. You know, when you feel like you're in a hellish situation, you know, God will meet you there. That's part of his beauty. And if I did ascend into the heavenlies, you are there, O oh God. And like it says here, but you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's, that's just aspects of his beauty. And when you begin to gaze on these attributes of who Jesus is, it begins to change you and transform you. That beauty starts to rise within you. You know, people that marry for external beauty and they find out that the external doesn't go into the heart, you know, there can be incredibly beautiful people that have warts and pimples on the outside. You know, because it's true beauty shines from the inside because when the Spirit of God moves upon us, He begins to transform us from the inside out and change us from that place. That's what beauty is all about. And I believe that the Holy Spirit has one primary mission on the earth, and that is to make Jesus known. That's his primary mission. Yeah, he's there to transform. He's there to shed abroad the love of the Father into your hearts. But I believe he's there to do it by making Jesus known to us. Our bridegroom, the beauty of God in, in the midst of our lives. You know, the best kept secret about God, you know what the best kept secret about God is? I believe it's God himself. So I, he is transcendent in all of his ways. If you think about God as an uncreated, transcendent God, you know, uncreated, you and I are created. The little one-cell amoeba is created. It makes more sense, therefore, that a one-cell amoeba could understand you and I more than it makes sense that you and I could understand God who is uncreated because we're created beings and he's uncreated. But... Hebrews, the book of Hebrews comes in and suddenly we begin to get a revelation of who God is. We begin to get a revelation that is provided to us because I think the Lord in his infinite wisdom knew that we needed encouragement, knew that it was possible for the church to begin to stray or go aside and so they give us Hebrews and so here it is starting at chapter one, verse one, God, meaning the father, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways, you know, he, he talked, he, he spoke to them. He spoke to his children Israel many different ways. But it says, in these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. He's spoken to us through Jesus Christ, whom he appointed heir of all things. Why would, why would the father appoint Jesus the heir of everything? I'm not going to answer that question, but I hope you know. I mean, I'm kind of answering it throughout the whole message right? Do you know? If you don't know, I would urge you to study into it because Jesus has been appointed the heir of everything that has been created. And then it goes, through whom also he made the world. Father made the son, made the world through Jesus. If you want to know more about that, just take a look at Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 31, okay, where it describes the whole creation. And in Proverbs 8, it actually speaks about wisdom, but I believe wisdom is, is personified in Jesus, you know, in the Godhead, as it were, where wisdom is there with the Father, creating the world and all the details behind the world. Read it, Proverbs 8, 22 to 31. And I know that at the end of that, around verse 30, 31, the statement is, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. You know, I picture Jesus at the creation with the Father, rejoicing always, everlasting joy with the Father before him. He says, rejoicing in the habitable parts of his earth and my delights were with the sons of men. You see, the delight of, of Jesus was, was not only in the Father, but it's with us as the creation. You know, there's such everlasting rejoicing and joy as he looks upon us, the habitable earth. I believe that was the, the crowning part of God's creation was creating you. You are the top part. The, the chief of God's creation is the human heart. And he surrounds it with a, with a body. 
You know, he gives us a soul, emotions to be able to enjoy him with, to, to be able to, to come alive because of who he is. And so through Jesus, the Father also made the world. But here's why we can know what the Father is like. We as, as created beings, we can know what the uncreated God is like. Because in Hebrews 1.3, it says he, referring to Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, of the Father's glory. And he's the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. And so you want to know what the Father is like? Look at Jesus. Begin to gaze upon the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ, and you'll get a revelation of what the Father is, who he is, what he's like, what, is, what he values, what he holds dear. And as we begin to gaze upon Jesus and look at him and study him, yes, but speak to him and pray to him and commune with him and enjoy his presence, you begin to have revelation of who the Father is. Because scripture says that we've all sinned and we've fallen short of God's glory. Well, if we've fallen short of God's glory, that tells me that we were actually meant for God's glory. We were meant to dwell in the place of glory. We were meant to dwell in the place of beauty. You know, I've been created for beauty. You are beautiful. And this whole process of sanctification is something where the Lord is forming us, is, is, is reforming us, is bringing us back to the place that we, he had always intended for us, which was in the garden prior to the fall, before sin came and stained us and, and began to destroy who we were. Because Jesus came and he brought back identity and he brought back destiny to us again. And when we begin to fall in love with him, and begin to see who he is, we get to have a picture of who the Father is. This Father who is revealed in Proverbs 8 as having all of his delight in the sons of men. That's also written in Psalm 16.3. I like the New American Standard. But it says, as for the saints that are on the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. You know, I urge you, don't allow a spirit of inferiority to come upon you. You are majestic. You are royal tonight. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And He created you in His image. And you have a purpose, and you have a destiny, and you have a calling. And He delights in walking with you day by day by day. And He finishes things before He starts them. So don't condemn yourself for who you're not. Begin to celebrate who you are. Okay? Let's, let's celebrate where we're at and who, who we are today. Because he sees things. He sees that finished work of Christ when he begins to look at us. And so it continues on in verse 4. And it says, and he, meaning Jesus is, oh yeah, I already said that, verse 3. Um, uh, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When he made purification of sins. And so the reality is, is that everything that had been lost in paradise Something had to happen. Purification for those sins needed to take place. And no one was considered worthy but Jesus. And when Jesus paid that price, he sat down at the Father's right hand. Now, interesting, because later in Hebrews, it speaks about how the earthly tabernacle, Moses' Moses's tabernacle, was a symbol of what was in the heavenly. And so we studied Moses' tabernacle, and it's a perfect picture of what's in the, in the heavenly. The Lord gave that picture to us. But there's no place to sit down. There's, the priest never sat in the Old Testament. But here's Jesus who would sit down at the right hand of the Father. Why is that? Because it's a demonstration of the fact that a priest's work under the Old Covenant is never finished. You constantly need to pay the price year in, year out always making atonement for sins, always taking care of the sacrifice. But under the new covenant, the work of Jesus on the cross, it is a finished work. And he can sit down at the right hand of the Father until that day comes when he returns again and we get to join him. That's when he's going to get up again. And so continuing on, having become as much better than the angels, angels meaning messengers, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. See, Jesus has a more excellent name than the angels. 
For which of the angels did he or the father ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you, and again I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. See, the point is, is the father never said that to angels. You know, he, he said that to his son, Jesus. And when the father looks at humanity, did you know that he sees one of two atoms? I don't mean A-T-O-M, I mean A-D-A-M. He sees Adam, but he either sees the first Adam or he sees the last Adam. See, the first Adam was a man of sin, a man that, that contained that place of sin that could never fully eliminate or get rid of the sinful nature. But the last Adam was Christ Jesus, who 1 Corinthians states is, is the last Adam. He paid the price. He finished the work that the first Adam was unable to finish. And so today... You know, when the Father looks upon us with great delight, when He sees you, He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see the stain of the sin if you've come to Christ. He sees the last Adam who hung on the cross became a curse for you and I so that you and I could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Father looks upon you and He says, I want to give you what my Son Jesus deserves. Are you happy about that? Do you want that? I want what the Son deserves, what Jesus deserves. And it's the Father's good pleasure, Jesus said, to give us the kingdom. Jesus deserves the kingdom. And everything that's in it, kingdom means king's domain. It means a realm, a realm where he rules and reigns. It is both physical and spiritual. And so the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. It's within you. Kingdom of God is within you. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it is also a real physical reality that we will be able to touch and feel and see even in the age to come and in times to come. And so what's taking place here is throughout the book of Hebrews, the writer is speaking about Jesus and talking about all the different things that he's superior to. And it starts with saying he's superior to the angels in chapter 1 and 2. Jesus is superior to the angels. Because he's saying, I didn't talk to the angels and say that, you know, I, I, I will be a father to you. You'll be a son to me. And by the way, if you are in Jesus today, if you're in Christ Jesus, you are a son of your heavenly father. And that spirit of sonship begin, be, becomes, comes upon us. And so, you know, what does that tell us? I believe that says to us that even as we look at Jesus and his divine leadership over the planet that he has been established by the Father to lead the earth, to provide leadership over the entire realm of the earth. That says to me that even from a practical hermeneutical perspective, you and I can't be leaders until we learn to be sons. Because it's the spirit of sonship that allows us to lead in a way that represents the Father. It's that that glory of God and sonship within us. And so it goes on in verse 6, and when he, meaning the Father, when he again brings the firstborn, meaning Jesus, into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And so there's a promise. We have this sure hope that the writer of Hebrews was speaking to these people that were, you know, tempted to stray and to fall away because of the pressure of persecution, because they were under persecution by the Roman Empire. And they're saying, listen, Jesus will come again. He's going to come again. I want to say to you today, if there's somebody here that is feeling this, this, you know, this temptation, or you're just feeling like, is it really worth it? Even for those that might be watching online, you know, am I going to follow? Like, is this faith for real? Are we really going anywhere? I want to say Jesus is coming back again. The Father will bring him back, and the angels of God will begin to worship him. And now, the writer of Hebrews begins to speak about the angels. He said, of the angels, he said, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, which is a quote of Psalm 104. You know, a lot of the new covenant is quotes of the old, by the way, a massive portion. And the book of the Bible that quotes the Old Testament the most is the book of Revelation. Just a fascinating little bit of trivia that actually is very meaningful when you begin to realize that. The book of Hebrews has a lot as well. And so here we have this quote of Psalm 104, that he makes his ministers a flame of fire. Well, what does that word ministers mean? It means a public servant. I believe angels will not only be worshipers of God, but they're also servants 
of mankind or benefactors of man. Because you and I are in Christ Jesus, that means that our entire future ahead of us, we will have angels that will serve us. Are you happy about that? I mean, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, hasn't entered into our hearts the things that the Father has prepared for those that love him. And so ministers are flame of fire. You know, they're, they're, they're winds, they're flames of fire. There's, I believe there's angels present today. I believe that we can ask the Father to send angels to do his bidding, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that momentarily. But he goes on, he says, you know, that's what angels are like. But then he contrasts the angels to his son Jesus. Again, it's a revelation of who he is. He says, of the Son, the Father says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the Father is actually speaking to his Son, Jesus, who humbled himself, left the place of incredible fellowship in heavenly places, and the Father is saying, you are God. So it's an affirmation of the Trinity. It's an affirmation of the, the, the Godhead, that Jesus is God. And he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. That means it is for every age. Ephesians 2 speaks about the ages to come. And so for, ever, for the ages to come, Jesus will be Lord. Jesus will be King. Jesus will be a bridegroom. You and I will be the bride as we continue until the end to love him and to follow him. We will be there with him. And so, you know, his throne is representative of his power. You know, that God is all-powerful, that Jesus will have all power. And the righteous scepter, it says, meaning the rod or the staff, which implies the authority, the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. And again, a kingdom is the realm of his royal rule. And so Jesus will forever have this royal scepter that he's going to rule the earth with as, as the place of his authority and his power that the Father has said, it's my good pleasure to give you, Jesus, the kingdom. And those that are in Christ have this privilege and promise of ruling and reigning with him. Part of our incredible future that's to come. And so why would the Father say that to Jesus? You know, I mean, some of it might say, well, that's self-evident, isn't it? But it says it in the verses following. That's why I love the word of God. It's, it's, it's incredibly inspired. You know why? Because you have loved righteousness and you have hated lawlessness. You've loved righteousness. That word is agape. You know, I think it refers again to, to that place of, of social and moral even, moral love of righteousness. I have a question for you. In the process of your sanctification, in your journey towards eternity, how much do you love righteousness? I want to love righteousness more tomorrow than I, do yes, than I did yesterday. I, I want to have a passion for righteousness. But on the same vein, Jesus hated lawlessness. Another, well, when you look at the, the word for lawlessness, it refers to wickedness or iniquity or transgression. You know, there's a lot of wickedness around us. The Bible says in, in Isaiah that gross darkness will cover the earth, but the glory of the Lord will, will rise upon you. And the glory of the Lord will cover the earth even as the waters cover the sea. And so my, my question is, do you love righteousness and hate lawlessness? And, and I believe Jesus hated it and loved it with perfect love and perfect hatred. And likewise, it's like, God, give me that kind of love, to love what you love and to hate what you hate. We can do a whole study on loving what God loves and hating what he hates. We could be here for a couple years if we did that, right? But, and so he has this righteous scepter. And, and because Jesus loved righteousness and he hated lawlessness, the writer to the Hebrews said, Therefore, God, referring to the Father, God, your God, your Father, Jesus, he has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. You know, the oil, he's anointed you. First of all, that word anointing, actually, if you trace it all the way back, it's representative of being the king. You know, the king of Israel. King, uh, anointed for a task, anointed with a role. He's anointed you with the oil of gladness. You know, gladness is this place of exceeding joy. You know, everlasting joy. You know, as the children of God, my, my, my thought is, God, we are supposed to be joyful all the time. 
Happiness depends on what happens. Joy depends upon who you are. You know, things can go wrong around us. I want to walk in everlasting joy. The promise in the, in the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures is everlasting joy will be upon their heads. Gladness and joy, right? And so Jesus has been anointed with everlasting joy. He, he laughs over you. He rejoices over you with singing. He, think, he looks upon you and there's everlasting joy. The oil of gladness, that exceeding joy, above your companions. That actually, that word above is often translated beside. That tells us that you and I are going to be beside Jesus as his companions, and we're going to enter into all this everlasting joy forever and ever and ever, eternally, from age to age, ages to come, enjoying this. That's what we were created for. We were created for discouragement, anxiety, and depression. And so, God, help us to love righteousness and hate lawlessness so that we can fully enter into this. We give you permission to continue that work of sanctification in our hearts. And then he goes on and says, You, Lord, in the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. You know, it's, it's again, the Father is exalting and honoring the Son here. And he says, they, then he goes, they will perish, but you remain and they will all become old like a garment and like a mantle you will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same, referring to Jesus. And so the earth is going to roll up like a garment. It's like, how many put new clothes on tonight? You know, you wore different clothes. It's like you take the garment off, you put the garment on. The, the world, the earth is going to be rolled up like a garment. It's going to perish. But Jesus remains the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And like a mantle, you know, you roll them up. It's going to be changed. And your years, referring to Jesus, will not come to an end. There's this eternal, we, we, we serve, we walk with, we love an eternal God. And so what's the point behind this? This is an indication that there's a new heaven and a new earth coming. We have this new heaven and new earth that we can look for and long for. Does that mean we don't need to worry about this earth? We don't have to care about it? I would suggest you don't carry that attitude. I think we, when we are stewards of the earth right now, in our realm of influence, when we steward what God has given us, I believe it shows faithfulness. It gives us the heart of Christ and the heart of the Father towards the earth around us. And as we steward it, he begins to look and say, this person, my son, my daughter over here, carries my heart, carries my love for the planet. I'm just wrapping up now. If I could have the worship team come forward, please. And so then Jesus ends, in, in, or the, word, the, the book ends in, in verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? The implication is, is that's what the Father said to Jesus. Sit down here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You know what that verse tells us? It actually says a lot. There's a lot hidden in there if you're willing to look. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search a matter out. Proverbs 25, 2. That verse actually gives us a secret to when Jesus is coming back. Blank faces. <laughs> Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. And I'm sure he stands up sometimes to look out and say, look at my son, look at my daughter. Wow, aren't they incredible? You know, look at the decision. Look at the way they stand against unrighteousness. Look at the way they love me the way they worship, the way they're courageous in getting their hearts healed up, agreement, agreeing with this process of sanctification. But he says, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, that tells me that there's a time coming when the Father, in transitioning to the age to come, is going to bring all the enemies, all the people that insisted on hating Jesus. And he's saying, listen, I won't force you to spend eternity with me. The non-negotiable is, is that my son Jesus will reign over the planet. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I would love for you to accept him and to come into agreement with, with my choice of his leadership. But if you won't, and if you really want to live a life and, and, and live in eternity because your spirit is eternal, if you really want to live a life eternally without me, we'll make that arrangement. 
And it says he's going to gather all of his, he's going to gather his enemies. They're going to be a footstool for his feet. Scripture in Zechariah speaks about how the enemies of God are going to be gathered into Jerusalem and there's going to be a great last battle. It also references it in Revelation, I believe it's chapter 16, where they're all going to come and they're going to gather for that last battle where Jesus will be triumphant over all. And that'll be a great and a terrible day. Scripture talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's going to be great for all of us that love him. It's going to be great for those that have longed for him. It's going to be great for those that have needed to endure. It'll be terrible for those that didn't believe in him. You know, it'll be a horrible, horrible day for those that rejected him. Zechariah also says that they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will mourn. They will mourn over him that they pierced because they're going to realize you really are the son of God. You really are who you said you were. And they're going to, be, they're going to begin to weep and travail and, and mourn. But those of us that, you know, have said yes to him, that have received the revelation, will, will walk into that place of all eternity. We'll, we'll, we'll see this place where the Lord gathers his enemies and makes them a footstool for his feet where essentially they're going to be trampled on. I mean, Luke chapter 19 gives us a parable about the minas, and I believe it's more literal than we might want to think, but it says what, he, what happens to the enemies of God. All right, but I don't want to dwell on that. I want to dwell on the fact that God is waiting. You know, some of you might say, well, why is he waiting so long to come back? Well, first of all, Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour, but the Father knows. The Father knows the day or the hour, but... You know, God as Father is long-suffering. He doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to miss out. You know, he, he's, he's long-suffering, waiting, waiting, waiting. And some of you are saying, God, aren't you a God of justice? There's so much injustice happening around us. I hate the lawlessness that's happening in our culture. I hate the lawlessness. In our, I hate the way our governments spend money. I hate the way people treat you and treat others and the laws that are happening and the, the way ethics come and you know the fact that courts are not judging righteously anymore. I hate it. But the Father's saying, I know, I understand. You keep praying, you watch and pray. You keep praying for justice and righteousness because they are the foundations of my throne. But in the meantime, we need more people to get saved. More have got to come into the kingdom. It's not my will that any would perish, but that all would come to the place of eternal life, that all would come to the revelation of the saving grace of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. That's the heart of the Father. That's the Father's heart, the love of God for each one of us. And so when he makes his enemies a footstool for his feet, the Father's going to say, okay, Jesus, you can get up now. You can, rest, you can go back to the earth. And then this passage just ends with this one verse. Are they not all ministering spirits, referring to the angel, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That word sent out is actually the word apost apostello. It's that word for apostolic, that, that being sent out. Those angels are sent out even in an apostolic kind of form to minister to the heirs of salvation. How many heirs of salvation do we have here? See, I've been saved already, but I'm also being saved. That means I've got angels that minister to me. For those of you that are saved, that have received Jesus Christ into your life, you're also in this process of sanctification. Your final salvation comes in the glorification of your body. That's when it comes. And until then, we get ministering angels to come and minister to us because we're heirs of salvation. Why don't you stand with me, please? I don't know how many of you have relatives that... You know, relatives that need Jesus. Relatives that aren't saved. I know we had a call tonight for salvation. I want to extend another invitation. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, my urgency to you, my urgent request to you is don't leave this place without him. You know, American Express used to have this logo, don't leave home without it. I would say, don't leave this earth without him. Don't leave earth without Jesus. And you don't know, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in your future. We know who holds the future, but we don't know what tomorrow brings. And so I want to say that if you feel conviction of the Spirit of God, and you feel like you need to come back in, and maybe I'm speaking to more people that are on the internet than anywhere else, my, my, my urgent request of you, my, my petition to you is don't 
Turn off the internet, the TV, whatever it is, without giving your life to Jesus. Don't leave this room without saying, God, I, I want to repent. I want to change the way I think. I need you. I acknowledge the fact that I've sinned and I've fallen short of your glory. I didn't realize that there was so much glory that awaited me. And I want to enter into it. I want to follow you and believe you with all my heart. And if that's you today, I want to, I want to ask you to put up your hand where you are. I want to invite you, if you're watching on the internet, to just get on your knees and pray a prayer. And repeat after me, dear Jesus, I confess that I've fallen short of your glory. I confess my sin. I need you and I want you in my life to forgive me and cleanse me and wash me and make me new. I want to follow you, Jesus, with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. In Jesus' name, amen.